Jill, here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. Lockpicking and hacking is one of the more thankless tasks in game design these days. Nobody really cares when you do it right, but people love to complain when they feel it's done wrong. Despite this, they've managed to become a staple of video games. What purpose does lockpicking serve, and would we really miss it if it were to disappear? On a fundamental level, lockpicking minigames add a barrier to entry. They ask you to prove you have a certain skill in order to proceed. They can also be useful for adding character and presence to a game, whilst giving the player a slight power fantasy feeling. While they can add variety, a problem does occur when these basic mundane puzzles are used multiple times. The majority of these puzzles, while not terrible in their own right, hardly challenge the player and are usually simple quick time events or matching tile puzzles. There's no strategy or meaningful thought involved, and after a while it feels more like a chore and you may start to question whether it's even worth it. This is what people think about when you mention lockpicking or hacking, but it's not the only option. In fact, by my count, there are four different ways to handle lockpicking. Possibly five, but for now we're just going to focus on four. The first, minigames, we've already talked about. Secondly, you can allow stats to dictate the outcome, an approach commonly found in RPGs like KOTOR or Pillars of Eternity. Unlike the minigame approach, there is no tangible feel to be found here, nor any skill, as you are literally just pointing and clicking. However, it is faster and still has a feeling of accomplishment to it, as you can see the direct result of the stats you have leveled being shown in the gameplay. Thirdly, we have a real-time obstacle, where unlocking something is only a matter of time. This is commonly found in stealth games like Metal Gear Solid V or the Hitman series. This requires much less input from the player, to the extent that you'll pay more attention to the environment rather than the lock. However, it is simple, effective, and doesn't ruin the pacing of the game, allowing you to focus on the objective at hand, rather than a puzzle. Finally, lockpicking can be a simple consumable, where there is little to no input from the player, and requires an entirely different thought process altogether, as you have to exercise resource management, rather than solve a puzzle or manage your surroundings. A good example of this can be found in The Last of Us, which is a game all about resource management, especially on the harder difficulties, as shivs are not only used to unlock doors, but are also weapons, so you have to decide carefully before busting open locks. We don't even have to stop here, as applying combinations of these obstacles is also common. In Skyrim, you have to solve a basic puzzle, watch as your skills level up, and apply resource management as you may only have so many lockpicks. In KOTOR, you get to level up certain skills which directly affects the number of resources it takes to hack a terminal. And in the Splinter Cell games, starting a lockpicking minigame doesn't freeze the outside world, so you have to be careful of patrolling guards who may still be looking for you. On their own, these segments are hardly worth writing home about, but adding an extra dimension to even the most mundane of puzzles can make it much more exciting and interesting. For example, let's compare the hacking minigames found in Bioshock 1 and Bioshock 2. Looking at the puzzles themselves, I think most would agree that the first one is better, as it actually requires some logic, whereas the second one is little more than a quick time event. However, no matter how much you may enjoy playing Pipe Mania, Solving this puzzle over and over again can get a little boring as there are no other obstacles to overcome. But in Bioshock 2, you also have a real-time element to work with, which makes this otherwise simple puzzle much more exciting as you try to contend with enemies at the same time. Many games can be effective, but rarely on their own. For all they add to a game, there are examples where removing them has made a positive improvement. Like in Mass Effect 2, which had some rather unremarkable minigames which were all completely removed for the sequel, which didn't detract from the experience at all, with many people, including myself, barely realising that they were gone. In Mass Effect 3, the only barrier to entry is now exploration, which is actually the fifth possible approach to lockpicking, where passing through a locked door requires you to find the key, investigate to discover the password, or simply make someone tell you. As for finding hidden items, that merely requires you to head off the beaten path and explore a little. The reason why I was reluctant to include this in the list is because firstly, you're not really picking a lock, and secondly, it is very similar to the minigame approach. You want to proceed or find a certain item, but there's a problem stopping you. However, the exploration and investigation angle feels so much more organic and natural as you're interacting with the game as you normally would, instead of being asked to solve a random puzzle which can take players out of a game. 
Asking the player to investigate and explore to find hidden trinkets feels like a pleasure if the game is fun in its own right, to the extent that you get more satisfaction from finding the treasure than you might from the treasure itself. This, on the other hand, feels like busy work, which merely gives the illusion of a challenge. Incorporating level design into the process is by no means an easy task, but it's so much more rewarding to the player. Not to say that the minigame approach never works, in fact I really enjoyed the one from Deus Ex Human Revolution, but it is somewhat strange that it's become the standard when tackling lockpicking, given that it uses up working hours that could be better used elsewhere, and is rarely, if ever, truly effective. The only major advantage over the other options that minigames have is on the purely aesthetic level, as it gives the player a more tangible feel. Therefore, if you still plan to use this approach, you should forego the pop-up screens and try to enforce the illusion that the player is actually interacting with the world. Ultimately, when you decide to put lockpicking or hacking in your game, you need to determine what purpose it serves. Why are you putting them in there in the first place? And which of the following will allow you to accomplish that the most?